Um, good evening, everyone. I welcome all of you to the last panel of Project Tiger Conservation, Conflict, and Critique, an online symposium on the past and futures of a controversial conservation program. This is a collaboration between the Sheffield Animal Studies Research Center and the Indian Animal Study Collective. I'm Susan Harris. I'm a PhD student at IIT Delhi. Uh, earlier today, we had two excellent sessions in the afternoon exploring the theme histories from above and below. This panel is called Contested Futures, and we have two compelling papers. Uh, Biswajit Sarma's presenting on Reinventing Conservation Project Tiger in the Kasaranga National Park. And then we have a collaborative paper uh, with Nitin D. Rai, Paromita Bhatija, and Shruti Jagadish, whose paper is titled Founding Tigers, Authorizing Accumulation, Tiger Conservation as an Eco-Scale Fix. Um, and responding to them, we have Jared Margulis as the respondent. Um, I'll just, uh, just brief uh, introductions about today's speakers. Uh, Biswaji Sarma is a postdoctoral fellow at the Moturi Satyanarayana Center for Advanced Study in the Humanities and Social Sciences, Kriya University. He is writing a monograph on the environmental history of the Kasaranga National Park. Nitin Rai is a political ecologist whose research interests include analyzing the impact of neoliberal and coercive conservation practices on people and landscapes. Paramita Bhatija is a PhD student in the Geography Department at The Ohio State University, and she's interested in conservation practices through the lens of modern human geography and political ecology. Shruti Jagdish is a PhD candidate in the Geography Department at the University of Colorado Boulder, and she's interested in the everyday lives of youth in conservation areas. And the respondent is Jared Margulies who is an assistant professor in the Department of Geography and the Environment at the University of Alabama. He has published work related to tiger conservation and is the author of The Cactus Hunters, Desire and Extinction in the Illicit Succulent Trade. Um, the papers will be for 30 minutes each, followed by the respondent offering comments on the papers, and then we have the Q&A. Um, the part, the audience will be able to ask questions or post uh, comments in the chat box only during the Q&A. Um, so first we have, uh, I invite Biswajit Sarma to present his paper, Reinventing Conservation Project Tiger in the Kazuranga National Park. We can't hear you, I don't think. Can anyone hear? No, I can't hear him either. Am I audible now? Aha. Yes. Am I? Okay. Um, I thank Sun, Dominic, and Anu for giving me an opportunity to present here, and all the participants who thought a Friday evening or afternoon, depending upon where you are, worth this. I would like to begin by saying that I began to explore Project Tiger only recently, but my research on Kajiranga's conservation history still gives us a historical grounding to the life of Project Tiger in Kajiranga and the multiple contested meanings around it, which all the speakers from the previous session spoke about so nicely. I will begin with this in February 2011. Nearly 2,000 protesters representing the Jeep Safari owners, students, peasants marched from Kohara near the main entrance gate of the Kajinanga National Park to Boka Hut, the subdivisional headquarter. The protesters demanded the denotification of the Tiger Reserve in Kajiranga. 
Kajiranga was notified as a tiger reserve in 2007. Protesters asserted that Kajiranga was for the rhino and not for the tiger. These protests were building up from some time and continued at different intensity after that too. The protest underscored the fractures over what the Kajiranga National Park stood for and how the Project Tiger deepened these cracks. I am going to outline a decade to decade build up to the coming of Project Tiger through the conservation history of the park. I propose that Kajiranga's entry into Project Tiger in 2007 was necessitated by its unique topography and the need to uphold a protectionist regime it entered from the late 1960s. Is the second screen coming? Yeah. Thank you. The park was first established as a game reserve in 1908 to protect the greater one horned rhinoceros. It was renamed a wildlife sanctuary in 1950 and a national park in 1974. Today, the park is home to nearly 2,600 rhinos of the 4,000 surviving in the world of this species. The park also has one of the highest densities of tigers in India's protected areas. Estimated 1,300 men and women protect the park, which includes some sophisticated commandos. It makes Kajiranga one of the highly protected areas in India. The rhino has an important place in Assam's public life. It's the symbol of Assam State Transport Corporation since 1950, and I grew up reading the textbook with its cover page that reads, Rhino, and I quote, Rhino is Assam's pride and one who kills is Assam's enemy, unquote. Issues of rhino protection feature very prominently in Assam's elections since at least a decade. The success of rhino conservation became evident in the 1960s. A census suggested that Kajiranga had 366 to 400 rhinos. This context of success is important. The success came a few years ahead of the huge uproar over the vanishing tigers from the Indian landscape in the 1960s. And even the experts were not sure whether the lions in the Gir forest had made a comeback. Thus, among the charismatic triad of Indian wildlife, the tiger, lion, and rhino, the rhino gave India the first taste of success in conserving a big mammal. The success is not just a chronological first. It helps us think about Indian conservation history in a different light. For instance, India's ecological restoration is dated to the 1970s, primarily under the stewardship of Prime Minister Indira Gandhi. The rhino's success, ahead of the deep national animal lion and the future national animal tiger, shifts our focus to the regional drivers of India's conservation history. To be sure, revival of the rhino came through the efforts of Assamese political elites. Ironically, the rhino was an absentee animal in the Assamese folklore and literature until the mid-20th century. After independence, the rhino began to capture Assamese imagination as it became one of the global conservation icons. I have explored the history of rhino conservation from the early 20th century until the 1970s in two published articles. For today's purpose, I am trying to underscore that Rhino's revival came through a decentralized governance of India's wildlife, which had some space for rural rights of grazing and fishing. The 1970s brought a crucial break from such approaches to rhino conservation in Kajirama. I divide this talk into three parts. In the first part, I will give a historical background of a remarkable success in conserving the rhino in Kajiranga, focusing mainly on the post-independent period. In the second part, I'll outline the context in which Kajiranga made an entry to the Project Tiger in 2007. I'll conclude by summarizing how Project Tiger has redefined conservation in Kajiranga in the last decade or so. It is important to briefly discuss the topography of Kajiranga National Park. The park lies in the fluvial floodplains of the Brahmaputra. The Karbi Hills roll up to the south of the park. There are many streams flowing down the Karbi Hills and meander through the park giving it a swampy character. The park receives Brahmaputra's annual floods, which regenerates its grassland where the grasses grow up to 11 to 15 feet. The park is ringed by villages and tea gardens.
all along its southern, eastern, and western boundaries. The stretch of the Brahmaputra River flowing to the north of the park forms its northern buffer zone. In the northern riparian edges, the borders have always been porous due to the braided course of the Brahmaputra River. My emphasis is on the watery and grassland character of the park and its porous edges, which has historically challenged the establishment of a protectionist regime. Although colonial government's notification on game reserve banned hunting, fishing, and foraging inside it, it was soon compelled to adopt a more flexible approach to conservation. The colonial government allowed a limited number of graziers in the reserve's periphery, primarily to enlist the support in protecting the rhino. The maximum of seven men patrolled the park of 430 square kilometers until India became independent. Imagine just seven men patrolling just uh, patrolling such a difficult terrain, which is roughly 100 times the Moidan in Kolkata, if you are familiar, or 300 times the Hyde Park in London. After independence, <clears throat> these privileges came under intense review, partly due to the pressure from conservationists like Salim Ali. In February 1950, P.D. Stracy, an Anglo-Indian forest officer who headed the forest department of Assam, camped in Kajiranga for a week. He found that the department cannot patrol the porous borders without the support of the graziers. Thus, graziers were allowed to stay. Likewise, despite the reluctance of the forest officials, fishers were allowed to fish in two water bodies. In a nutshell, the post-independent government partially retained the flexibility adopted by the colonial government. Low-scale rhino killing was always there in Kajira. In 1950s, illegal rhino hunting for its horn did not make a buzz. Come the year 1960, the local press reported massive scale of rhino killing. The press reports were also a manifestation of the growing cultural value of the rhino. During 1965 to 70, at least 55 rhinos fell to the illegal hunters. Rhino killing came as an affront to the Assamese speaking people in whose imagination the rhino cemented an endearing place, place by now. The rhino became a symbol of dissent against the government and its protection began to be seen as an index of government's performance. On 9th February 1968, alleged rhino killers killed a young forest guard on duty inside the sanctuary. This incident rattled the press, legislative assembly and public life in Assam. The government was heavily criticized for not arming the forest personnel adequately. There were deep cracks visible in the flexible approach adopted until now. The government slowly changed its gear from a flexible approach towards a protectionist regime. As an immediate measure, the government of Assam sent 11 armed home guards to Kaziranga. The government also tabled Assam, is na uh, Assam, na sorry, Assam National Park Bill in Assembly, which became a law in 1969. The law allowed for the process to convert Kajiranga to a national park. But more importantly, the loyalty of graziers and fishers came to the question. The forest department never got a more favorable climate to remove the graziers and fishers from the national park in making. By the late 1960s, wildlife conservationists considered Kajiranga as one of the most remarkable protected areas in the country. In 1970, a committee of wildlife experts praised Kajiranga for its, and I quote, extensive self-contained eco-units, unquote, and they were impressed with the armed protection of the rhino in Kajiranga. When Project Tiger was mooted in the early 1970s, Kajiranga had estimated 30 tigers compared to only nine in Mana Wildlife Sanctuary, another protected area in Assam. However, Mana instead of Kajiranga was included in Project Tiger. The logic was that Kajiranga was already well protected and it received adequate attention. I would like to emphasize here that the strict protection in Kajiranga, as commented by the expert committee in 1970, was only recent in coming. Rhino's revival came through careful accommodation of rural livelihood. Even in 1960, just 55 men patrolled the sanctuary. The shift to a more exclusive protection from the late 1960s was a product of two decades of agrarian distress unrelenting <clears throat> scale of rhino hunting and growing cultural value of the rhino in Assamese imagination, which they explore in the two papers I mentioned a while ago. 
This new turn towards a strict protection led to a sharp decline in the number of illegal rhino hunting in the 1970s. The year 1972 recorded zero cases. Rhino population doubled between 1966 to 1978. This effect was also seen in the ungulate population in the park, like the water, water buffalo, swamp deer, and hog deer, all of which are prey species of the tiger. Estimate of the numbers of all deer species suggest an increase from about 5,000 in 1966 to 11,000 in 1984. Tiger numbers also rose steadily from 20 to 52, 20 in 1966 to 52 in 1984. These numbers need not be taken at their face value. It is just to highlight the numbers were perceived to be growing irrespective of the magnitude. This increase in wildlife population partly came from the use of violence in the new regime. Use of violence gave teeth to some of the long-standing regulations which became almost dead letters. For instance, the government of Assam banned deer hunting even in the buffer areas since 1956. Occasionally, the forest department pulled up even a mojada, a powerful Assamese gentry or a minister's son for illegal deer hunting. However, this regulation remained a dead letter insofar as the traditional community hunting was concerned. During the floods, peasants came out in large numbers in their canoes to hunt deer in the sandbars north of the park. Park authorities in its new avatar made it risky even for the fishers and deer hunters to enter the park or its buffers. The newly deputed home guards shot at not only the suspected rhino killers, but also the fishers. The park authorities fused the character of poacher with grazers, fishers, and foragers likely to be seen when shot, and likely to be shot when seen. At the national level, there were important developments taking place. The Wildlife Protection Act was enacted in 1972. The subject forest and wildlife was shifted from state list to concurrent list of Indian constitution. This propelled the union government from merely an advisory position to a steward's role in wildlife matters. India became a signatory to the sites, a convention that banned the trade on body parts of endangered animals like the rhino. Thus, the 1970s inverted the decentralized governance of India's nature in favor of the union government. One of the early manifestations of such shifting balance of power was when the union government stopped the government of Assam from auctioning the rhino horns after 1978. Until then, the rhino horn auctions formed a crucial part of Assam's revenue. Halting the sale of rhino horns did not, however, stall the demand for the rhino horns. Illegal rhino killing surged dramatically in the early 1980s at a scale more disastrous than in 1960s. A climate of unrest and political disorder favored this. In early 1980s, Assam was engulfed under the anti-foreigners agitation. Political peace returned in 1985, but illegal hunting continued unabated. In the 1980s, more than 300 rhinos were killed in Kajiranga illegally. Please recall that an estimated 366 rhinos in 1966 gave us the evidence of their revival. In the 1980s, the rhino, despite its impressive return, was once again at the crossroad. This drew even stronger public demand for its strict protection. The government of India sanctioned a rhino conservation fund of 50 million rupees in the mid-1980s for a period of five years. After the five years, it was the state government's responsibility. Until then, this was the biggest financial commitment to protect the rhino. As many forest officials acquainted with Kajiranga recall, this fund was a milestone to give Kajiranga a new makeover. This fund was instrumental in building a network of durable camps, roads, bridges, purchase of arms and ammunition, and deployment of elephants. As we'll see in the next slide, this injection of fund left an unfinished agenda in Kajiranga. After the first five years, the government of Assam failed to infuse money to protect the rhino. The centrally sponsored scheme could mitigate the instances of illegal rhino hunting, but could not reduce to a level of the 1970s. The rhino killing continued at somewhat reduced but still alarming level. In the 1990s, official figures show that over 200 rhinos were killed illegally. Government figures show that during 1991 to 1998, nearly 300 suspected illegal 
Rhino hunters were arrested and 48 were shot dead. However, the Forest Department of Police could hardly get conviction in the court. The procedural proclivity of Indian lower courts required the prosec prosecutors to prove that this bullet coming out of this gun shot this rhino. Moreover, as soon as the central support ran out, the park found itself in a difficult position to uphold its protectionist regime, which it entered at least from the late 1960s. A park director recollected later, and I quote, there was a time during 1995-96 when there was even no fund to feed the departmental elephants, unquote. I mentioned earlier that Kajiranga is located in a volatile flood plain. The network of roads, bridges, camps need annual maintenance due to flood. The water bodies need desiltation and the removal of water hyacinth. A sizable portion of the park expenditure when you're paying salary, leaving very few, leaving very small amount for what we can call as work. In the 1990s, the park was once again in trouble. It is in this context that the project tiger, if not the tiger per se, became important for the park managers. In 1997, the tiger estimation revealed 80 tigers in Kajiranga, which became 86 in 2000. In India, overall tiger numbers have recovered under protection, but in the 1990s, the tiger came under intense pressure from wildlife trafficking, which historian Mahesh Rangarajan calls as the second wildlife crisis in a small but remarkable introduction to India's wildlife history. In contrast, in Kajiranga, this pressure was only on the rhino and not on the tiger. The park managers in Kajiranga attempted to leverage this, growing numbers in tigers in the service of the rhino protection. In the tiger estimation report of 2000, the park director wrote, and I quote, Kajiranga National Park, which harbors more tigers than some of the project tiger areas in the country, needs special consideration either to be included in project tiger network or to bring Kajiranga Nas National Park under rhino project or in the line of project elephant or project tiger, unquote. To make his case stronger, the director presented a gloomy future for the tiger if Kajiranga did not receive money. He suggested that for the tiger to survive, it needed good prey base, which further required desiltation of water bodies and removal of weeds. In the Asian Rhino Group meeting held in Kajiranga in 2000, the Kajiranga <coughs> National Park director suggested that Kajiranga needed about 240 million rupees in the next five years. Kajiranga Park authorities kept pushing for its inclusion in Project Tiger or setting up of a Project Rhino. Around this time, it became a buzzword that Kajiranga had the highest density of tiger population in the country. In 1999-2000, in the year 1999-2000, Namiri, another tiger bearing area in Assam, was added to the Project Tiger. Neither a Project Rhino materialized nor Kajiranga was immediately included into Project Tiger. Kajiranga had a longer wait until 2007. I am yet to explore what happened in the intervening period. Many of you probably recall the debates around Tiger in the early 2000s. I was still struggling to score pass marks in school and undergraduate exams. But I faint memories of the controversy around the revelation that Tigers vanished from Sariska Tiger Reserve. In a hurried response, the government of India set up a task force, which my speaker mentioned, and by the late 2005, the NTCA was set up. The National Tiger Conservation Agency was set up. The NTCA was keen on bringing more areas under tiger reserves. In 2008-9, it included 10 existing national parks or wildlife sanctuaries as tiger reserves. This was the highest number of inclusion in a year since the Project Tiger began in 1978. It took the number of total tiger reserves in India from 28 to 38. The NTCA made inclusion of parks in the list of tiger reserves even more attractive. Project Tiger funding was shared 50-50 between the center and state. After NTCA is coming, center, set the uh, union government funded nearly 90% of the budget in the Himalayan and Northeastern states. The notification of Kajiranga Tiger Reserve came in 2007 in a very charged climate in Kajiranga's periphery. In 2006, Tiger killed 36, 37 cattle in neighboring villages of Kajiranga. In 2008, when the data gathering became more systematic, it was found that the tiger killed 140 cattle in that year. The tiger preferred the cow or bullock over goats or pigs. 
It directly affected a family's agricultural work. People's hostility towards the tiger was also on the rise. In late 2007, a tiger and its cub, a cub were a tiger and its uh, cubs were found killed in a nearby tea state. The WWF started paying compensation to the affected households. As per their report, they paid um, 2.85 lakh rupees against 135 cases of tiger killing livestock, which comes to an average of 2,100 rupees per case, peltry even for goats, let alone cows or bullocks. The tiger reserve sparked anger in so many fronts for compensation alone to be able to address. Slowly, the safari organizers, the jeep safari organizers, began to complain that the park authorities disallowed their entry in the core area. By September 2010, the protest became even louder. Circling back to where I began, the protest of early 2011, demanding the rollback of Project Tiger was in this backdrop. As a symbol of protest, eco-development committees or EDCs, which the park tried to set up since the early 2000s, dissolved themselves. The park authorities reiterated that the Project Tiger will bring more tourism to Kajiranga and the park will scale new heights but this hardly assuaged the protesters. By this time, the park was also trying to push for land acquisition for corridors, which were pending for almost two decades. Tiger depredations, Project Tiger's restriction on tourism, and fear of eviction all coals together to fuel the protest. Joel Smadja, a French geographer, has recorded the protest in a long piece. The protesters alleged that rhino belonged to Assam, not the tiger. According to the protesters, the tiger was cunning and cruel as opposed to the peaceful rhino. Smadja also noted that in Assam's body politic, where anti-immigrant sentiments run very high, the protesters equated the tiger with the illegal Bangladeshi infiltrators who are unwanted and to be expelled. The project tiger helped the park to overcome its financial crisis to a great extent. In 1997-98, the park's total budget was less than 30 million rupees. Going by the NTCA figures, it sanctioned over 50 million rupees to the park in 2014 alone, which was increased to 200 million rupees in 2019-20. There are obviously delays and fluctuations in the fund flow, but it is also undeniable that the financial resources at the park's disposal has increased manifold after its entry into the tiger. On the hint side, a considerable section of the people feel that Kajiranga's inclusion in Project Tiger has brought them immense restrictions and misery. The restrictions inside the park began to spill over to the surrounding areas. Project Tiger strengthened these restrictions on building on strengthened the restrictions on building houses or infra in eco-sensitive zones or corridors. Such restrictions are viewed by the people as precursor to evict them from their land. Several of my respondents told me that the park is secretly releasing tigers in the buffers where there were no buff, no tigers before. I'm aware that relocating tigers requires mobilization of considerable manpower and resources, which cannot go hush hush always. So I'm not going into the truth of such statements. The point I wanted to drive home is that the belief the park can do this. It underscores a deepening distrust among a considerable section of people towards the park officials and NGOs that aid them. This is more so among the older generation than the younger one. The increased funding helped the park to resurrect some of the eco-development committees or EDCs by 2014. In many villages, participation in EDCs still remain contested among the villagers. They fear that the EDCs are the instrument of the park to in increase their influence among the villagers. Even with irregular allocation of fund to the EDCs, the park has been able to regain some of its lost social base. A handful of active members of the EDCs invariably overlap an institution called Village Development Party, uh, uh, sorry, Village Defense Party, a village organization that aims to maintain law and order by closely working with the police. I had the opportunity to look at the activities before and after initiation of the Project Tiger in Kajiranga. There is a remarkable shift towards the attention towards the park and reporting on illegal hunters. Thus, they form a network of intelligence gathering for the park officials. I have asked an office bearer of a peasant organization, often critical about parks working. 
if any one of his members are part of the BDP? The answer was a resounding no. The loyalty has to be complete even if it is among a small section. But even among the EDC members, whose villages got community halls or school buildings through EDC funding, the fear of the park taking over the land is pervasive. This resonates with the observations made by uh, the previous speakers about the forest dwellers in Rajaji. But there is also a perceptible change in the stakeholders of conservation in Kajiranga. Organizations like the WWF, WTI, and RNYAK worked in Kajiranga from the pre-Tiger Reserve days. But Project Tiger considerably expanded the sphere of their functioning. They produced technical reports, compensate losses to Tiger, draw digital maps, and assist park in gathering evidence against crime. Thus, the park is more likely to rope in NGO workers, GIS experts, and wildlife crime investigators than the likes of the village heads, panchayat officials, or village elders as in the 1960s, 70s, and even in the 1980s and 1990s. The role of the EDCs or BDP still remains small. Community as a whole is relegated to an auxiliary role. Commenting on this shift in the constituency of, uh, in this constituency of the forest department's alleys, residents often decry that NGOs have come after they had already saved, after we have already saved the animals. Coming back to the rhino, it still remains, it still remains Kajiranga's star for people, park authorities, and most tourists. However, the Project Tiger gave it a whole new makeover and consolidated a protectionist regime it entered since the late 1960s. The Tiger, with its attacks on cattle in new areas every passing month, is slowly conveying people what else Kajiranga stands for in the days to come. Thank you. I conclude here. Um, thanks, Ms. Sujit, for that fascinating paper. Now we invite Nitin, Paromita, and Shruti to present their paper, and then we'll have a response by Jared, and after that, the Q&A. Um, thank you so much, Susan. Um, I'm going to present most of it, and I'm going to ask the co-authors to please jump in whenever it's needed. I'm just going to share my screen. Can you see that? Okay. Yes. Uh, so this is the paper. This paper is still a work in progress. It's titled uh, Counting Tigers, Authorizing Accumulation, Tiger Conservation as the New Medical Fix. It's based on the last four to five years, actually, of work focusing on India's tiger census, both how those numbers are generated and then how those numbers enter into public discourse um, and how they are used in other contexts. So I, I will go into it um, now. So this year, recently, India has finished 50 years of Project Tiger. And this is a tweet by, that, that sort of is explaining the celebration of, because the Project Tiger has now been categorized as a complete success, uh, as a sort of using the tiger census and the increase in tiger populations that has been documented by the census to uh, celebrate the success of this project. And this is sort of, sort of one of the ways in which it's an example of how this was done, which is to show that the doubling of tiger populations has been achieved and development and environment have thus been shown to not be mutually exclusive, but can happen alongside each other. Um, and so just sort of pulling back a little bit to Project Tiger, when it originated, we had nine tiger reserves across India. It has expanded in these 50 years to 53 tiger reserves. Um, tiger reserves have now become sort of emblematic of what all of us now talk about as fortress conservation, a sort of approach that relies on forced relocations, rights restrictions, and increasing surveillance in conservation spaces. Uh, now we have, like I said, 53 tiger reserves across the country, all of which are extensively documented uh, through the tiger census. Um, and 
Because I can't see. Okay. Um. So the last type of census which completed in 2022 was, I think, being talked about as the largest yet in many years of conducting this exercise. Uh, it involved 641,000 days of on-foot surveys, most of which are done by forest watchers, forest guards, and volunteers, covering 641,000 kilometers and over 47 million camera trap photographs. Um, and in fact, has now been put into the Guinness book as one of the largest ever wildlife census exercises conducted. And so the scale at which this was happening sort of led us to wonder or to ask the question of why is the state investing so many resources and so much money into this exercise? And that's what has led us to this paper and the analysis that we conducted. Um, this is... So the census, while the census actually began with Project Tiger in 1970, in the 1970s, the most publicized versions of this census have been what has become a once in four year estimate that begins with 2006 and goes on from there to the present to 2010, 2014 and 2018. And now we have the latest one that came out this year. Um, all of which have been used to show the success of Project Tiger and a consistent increase in tiger populations. But it is important to note that actually since Project Tiger started, the census has been taking place. But what we saw in 2006 was a sort of series of events that have been covered in previous sessions with the, the loss of tigers in Sariska triggering the creation of the Tiger Task Force. And based on the recommendations of the Tiger Task Force, there was a complete shift in methodology through which the tiger census was being conducted, and even the role of different kinds of actors. For example, the National Tiger Conservation Authority was created and made the sort of central body around through which all of the tiger census and project tiger governance was taking place. So based on all of this so far, our argument that we try to explore and unpack in this paper is that this emphasis on tiger numbers becoming a primary indicator of conservation success. So where tiger numbers become an indicator of overarching conservation success, allowing the state to justify an intensification of its current approaches to conservation inside protected areas, as well as the relaxation of environmental norms and increasing extraction and development through extraction outside of protected areas. And so a sort of multiple effects that have emerged through this emphasis on numbers. That's the argument that we are making. Uh, we are grounding our idea, which as we saw in the title of a numerical fix in the literature through a few key ideas. Um, the spatial fix, which is an idea introduced by David Harvey, who is a master's geographer, was focusing broadly on the idea of when capitalism faces anything that could hinder capital accumulation, any sort of challenge and contradiction to the expansion of capital accumulation, it, it has to rely on a spatial fix or like a geographical restructuring to ensure that accumulation can continue without those, you know, sort of can navigate those contradictions and challenges, which is a broad idea that came into the literature and political ecology under Noel Castry, who introduced the idea of an environmental fix and he was focusing specifically on how the governance of nature is changed, whether, for example, it is privatized or new kinds of nature are brought under state control. So it can be many different ways in which the nature's governance changes, but with the key objective of facilitating its conservation or its extraction. Um, and these, well, these are the two guiding ideas. One example through which this has been explored further is the idea of an eco-scalar fix where Cohen and Barker talk about how in order to ensure that nature can be governed in a particular way to ensure an objective of capital accumulation, what might happen is a change in scale of governance. Uh, what, what we are focusing on and arguing is that what we've begun to see under, the, under Project Tiger, especially in recent years, is that tiger numbers 
mechanisms are being used to fix by the state. And I will get into, I will explain what we mean by that. But we are trying to talk about the idea of a numeric metrics that are generated. And this is specifically the metric of tiger numbers, which is being used to measure and also now celebrate the success of Project Tiger as a conservation exercise more broadly which are generated at smaller scales. So you have metrics that are generated from individual tiger reserves, and then through statistical methods are used to derive estimates at a national scale of India's tiger population. And then in relation to that, to make claims about India's environmental as well as economic progress. Um, and so what we are saying is that it can be understood as a fix to address crises of legitimacy. So for example, crises around, is, is, can we continue at the current pace of extractive development as a crisis of legitimacy like that? And also broader crises of like environmental crises as we understand, say, conservation and even climate change. Tiger numbers are being used as to, pos to posit like a solution and a fix to these um, understood crises. So, this is sort of our broad question. How do tigers and specifically tiger numbers get appropriated by the state to simultaneously fix environmental crisis as well as economic production or the any kind of threat to capital accumulation, basically? Um, and we've understood it as happening through a series of steps and or moves that have taken place since Project Tiger started um, and continue to be exercised. It's not just that one is complete. These are all ongoing processes through which the fix takes place. Uh, the first being a territorialization of conservation and closures, which is the creation of tiger reserves and their governance in line with fortress approaches to conservation and state control over these spaces. And the second is a centralization of state control more broadly over conservation spaces and conservation projects. A simplification, which is an exercise of making conservation measurable through specific metrics, and in this case, a conservation by numbers and the metric of tiger populations and tiger numbers, and the exercise of actually conducting these estimations across all of India's tiger bearing landscapes. Um, and the fourth is a rescaling of tiger conservation success, where both using locally generated numbers to generate and derive a scaled up national estimate and then also how tiger conservation and tiger numbers are used to address broader environmental and economic issues and the fifth being a, a manipulation of environmental regulations at a national scale so this is to do with all kinds of environmental policies that we argue are being done by invoking conservation success at local scales by relying on tiger numbers. So, um, sort of looking back historically at the history of Project Tiger, Project Tiger, and again, this is something a lot of the speakers have talked about. Project Tiger started in the 1970s and it originally since its beginning has talked about the notion of making tiger habitats, setting aside tiger habitats that can be inviolate. And the idea of a place, uh, a set aside of nature that is not, dis like does not have human disturbance. But this was sort of, this at this time in the 1970s was a, sh a signal shift. It was moving away, like giving up spaces of production that were at that time maybe for agricultural production or timber production for the purposes of conservation and kind of anchored around tiger conservation. And this idea again in the 1970s was emerging globally. So we saw WWF, IUCN, and even the UNEP and UNESCO placing increased pressure on India to step up for tiger conservation at a global scale. And the WWF had started what was called Operation Tiger. Um, and actually this, a uh, global effort laid the foundation for what we now see Project Tiger operating as because it was placing emphasis on how, for example, in this quote, 
uh, it is clear that the tiger's habitat must be saved and that means protecting whole ecos ecosystems of forest with their host of in the interdependent plants and animals. So we began to see through the WWF's Operation Tiger, which was a global effort to generate funding for tiger conservation, an emphasis on the tiger as an indicator of overarching ecosystem health. And then that got taken up in Project Tiger, even though Project Tiger was a nationally led effort and it was not seen as separate to Operation Tiger, it was still getting its funding from WWF and all of these, this global alliance of international organizations that were created for Tiger Con that were creating funding for tiger conservation. And the idea itself of tigers as being a way through which to ensure broader conservation success emerged in this context. And so Project Tiger, this is from Project Tiger's 50 year celebration report and is I think uh, a great representation of the creation of the tiger as a symbol. So it draws on ecological studies that have positioned the tiger as an umbrella species, which basically implies that because of the tiger as an apex predator on top of the food chain, if, the, if, if tigers are successfully thriving in a landscape, it indicates that the ecosystem overall is healthy. And we sort of see through Project Tiger, this idea, this ecological idea being extracted into a broader, a broader effort to make the tiger, tiger not just an indicator of ecological health, but a symbol for conservation and conservation success. And this idea, even though it originated in the 1970s, we can see is still prevalent with the latest NTCA National Tiger Conservation Authority census report saying that tigers are not just a part of India's wildlife heritage, but also a symbol of the country's ecological richness and economic well-being. So once again, what we start to see is that the tiger is being given a role as a symbol that extends beyond maybe even physically, like, it, 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 well, that the tiger is being turned into a symbol that represents more than just the specific species, but rather that it indicates overall how conservation is doing. And we argue that this has happened side by side with both uh, an emphasis on a charismatic species approach to conservation angled around the tiger and a protected area model for conservation. And this is building on people claims that have been made for a while, but we're trying to draw emphasis to how the, the giving tiger, giving tigers this kind of symbolic power has allowed this to happen. Um, so again, so this has been talked about in previous sessions, but very briefly, the initial few censuses for a very long time were using what was called the pug mark method. The first ever census found 1,827 tigers in the country. But in more recent years, this method has been completely debunked and we have seen a move to camera trapping, which is still the method that is used. Um, and camera traps have been used to assert like, to, to publicize tiger numbers much more under Project Tiger, to, to make the, the tiger census a publicly, something that is engaged with by, by the public. And it's also used to claim the scientific legitimacy of these numbers because the Pagmark method was so widely debunked. And this so the shift to camera traps was also used to reestablish the legitimacy and importance of the tiger census. And while most of us are probably familiar, the camera trap method essentially involves placing cameras physically across tiger-bearing landscapes, usually on either end of a track or a trail, and capturing these images through which, because tigers have unique patterns of stripes, tigers are individually identified in at a local scale, and then through statistical estimation, numbers are derived for the broader tiger reserve. So for example, here we see BRT Tiger Reserve in Karnataka, these camera traps are placed and then used to generate at specific regions within the protected area, tiger populations. And then that is used to derive broader results, not just to the tiger reserve across tiger bearing landscapes. And since 2006, with this shift in method to camera trapping, we've seen these widely publicized tiger reports, tiger census reports come out. And this has kind of been the subject of our analysis too, these, the content of these reports. And during this time, we also see 
a shift in the role that different actors have played in the census. And so with the 2006 creation of the Tiger Task Force and the NTCA, we sort of see a gradual uh, shift in authority where by 2014, there was it was the NTCA that was solely announcing the results of the Tiger Census and was the only actor that actually had the authority to make claims in relation to it. And along with each of the numbers that were produced as a result of these censuses, we began to see how Tiger numbers were being used to then determine decision-making in protected area landscapes. So as a consequence of how many tigers were found in a specific tiger reserves, different kinds of recommendations and working plans were made for each landscape. Uh, and another thing that was consistent is the same idea of an inviolate space for tiger conservation that emerged in the 1970s has been reinforced and emphasized in each of these census reports. And we can see in each of these reports in 2014, 2018, there is a consistent emphasis on relocating Adivasi and forest dwelling populations from inside these tiger reserves to facilitate the creation of inviolate tiger spaces and allow tiger populations to continue to grow. And this is from an interview that was conducted by uh, us, by the co-authors a few years ago, where they, the sort of, that sort of documents this shifting role that different actors have played in the census. And so while in the early years, there was a push from global actors like the WWF and their experts to begin to keep track and monitor India's tiger populations and to begin to place emphasis on increasing these populations, there was a initial reluctance to bring in outside experts, which then led to over the years, an emphasis on the PAGMAC method, which was in, created by India's foresters. And then once that was debunked, you had an increasing role played by NGOs to establish and implement the camera trap approach to the point where today there has been specifically a centralization of the data that is generated through the camera traps and then the centralization of authority to announce these tiger numbers and even to claim, claim credit for the success of, for the seeming success that this story tells. Now, at the 50-year mark, we see the beginnings of what we are calling the numerical fix in this claim. It's It's been made consistently, but it's been most predominant since the 2006 shift to the camera trapping method, where we see the claim, and this is from the 50-year, celebrating 50 years of Project Tiger report published by the state, that the increase in tiger populations shows that we can have harmonious development and conservation where both conservation and development can happen in a mutually complementary manner. And so we're beginning to see the idea that tiger numbers increasing indicates not only the success of current approaches to conservation, but also seems to indicate that these approaches to conservation can happen alongside a continuing and even intensification of um, extractive development. And so, for example, on World Tiger Day, we see the quote made, and again, this is an emphasis on how public discourse is being shaped through the tiger census, right? How it's being brought in there and what it's being used to say and claim uh, that India will prosper both economically and environmentally, and will have will build more roads and have cleaner rivers. So there is this creation of the idea that these two things of successful conservation and, and rapidly expanding and intensifying extractive development can happen side by side. And that increasing tiger numbers allow us a metric through which to measure the success of both of these, the success of this harmony that they can happen alongside each other. And yet at the same time, and this is, we've used this uh, based on a report that has been compiled by Shomona Khanna and, Shomona Khanna and Pooja, who are advocates in New Delhi who have been gathering data about changes being made to India's broader spectrum of environmental policy since 2018 and 2019, which was when this the last, not the one that came out this year, but the, the most recent census before that was published, which was also incidentally when tigers, tiger numbers were shown to have successfully been doubled ahead of the target, right? And since this time, we have also seen parallelly a dilution of multiple different um, environmental policies across an, at a national scale. 
Mm, and we see this with biological diversity. We see it with mining and water policies, mineral policies, amendment to air pollution, and most notably, probably the Forest Conservation Act. All of these things, all of these shifts in policy, uh, while they have happened, we are not arguing that they are specifically uh, taking place as an outcome of tiger conservation. What we are trying to say is that we are seeing the states simultaneously first celebrate the success of tiger conservation with emphasis on this metric of tiger populations. Second, use that to make the claim that conservation and extractive development are not mutually exclusive and can take place side by side. And third, dilute environmental protections across the board on a national scale. And all of this to, to sort of summarize our idea that tiger numbers are being used to fix the crisis of legitimacy facing India's economic growth as well as environmental protections, right? So tiger numbers are being made into uh, an indicator through which we can say, for example, claim the success of conservation through which we can claim the success of environmental protections more broadly, which in turn allows and grants legitimacy to a continuing of extractive development and dilution of environmental protections to make that happen. And so we see intensification of current conservation approaches inside protected areas, because once you can claim that tiger numbers indicate the success of conservation, you can justify continuing to practice fortress approaches, which is relocating Adivasi communities, obstructing the granting of forest rights and implementation of the Forest Rights Act, as well as an increase in state territorialization. And so increasing surveillance and presence of state actors in these tiger reserves and protected, protected areas. But we also see an enabling of accumulation both inside and outside protected areas, where protected areas themselves for example, through the, you know, the creating of the tiger as an icon has increased tourism and tourism revenue. And also on a global scale, on a national scale, diluting environmental policy. And basically, alongside creating tiger reserves, we see the increasing intensification of creating spaces of extraction um, in sync with these spaces of protection, all of which is being used to sidestep India's performance on a whole range of other environmental indicators. So our question really is, to what extent is this emphasis on tiger numbers as a metric that indicates overarching success, allowing us to sidestep and distracting from performance on all of these other environmental indicators? For example, we know that the Forest Conservation Act amendment is going to lead to a extensive deforestation if, and, you know, um, hinder the conservation of a lot of species, including the tiger itself. And so that's really the question that we are asking as we continue to develop this idea is to what extent is that happening? Is the tiger number metric functioning as a numerical fix, which is allowing very large claims to be made both in terms of conservation success and in terms of to what extent uh, extractive accumulation can continue at the pace it's currently continuing at. Um, and yes, so that's the end of the presentation. And again, because it's a paper that we are still developing, even if you don't have questions, but suggestions and thoughts on how we might expand this idea, we would be uh, really grateful to hear them. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Parumita, for that paper. I now I invite Jared to respond to both these interesting papers. Um, thanks so much, <clears throat> Susan, and thanks to very much um, to our presenters um, in these really, really interesting papers. Um, so I'm I'm only going to present um, some some brief comments so we have plenty of time for for questions and these comments are are coming from having just listened to the papers now so forgive me if my thoughts are um still not um completely you know fully formed uh, but um in trying to draw out some interesting questions for us to think about um the 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 first question that comes to mind for me to think about and admittedly a, a somewhat rhetorical one 
from both of these really excellent works is the question of who are tiger rhinos and um, tigers made to serve. Um, these papers in different ways lead me to ask this kind of question. And alternatively, I think something that I've been thinking a lot about in relation to these papers is what would it mean to imagine an approach to conservation in India that was actually deeply ecological? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in that question because I would argue these papers reinforce my sense that Project Tiger reveals a deeply anti-ecological orientation towards wildlife conservation in India still to this day. Um, I'm happy to have people disagree with me or we could talk more about it. Um, and, you know, even as um, Pramota's in, 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 um, paper and presentation shows, um, it's happening hand in hand um, with an unwinding of environmental policies across India. Um, at the same time that we're seeing an increasing overemphasis, I would argue, on the tiger and the rhino as uh, both uh, indicator species, but also a sort of um, semiotic or symbolic indication that conservation is a unambiguous success across, across the country. Um, and so what these papers therefore show is that um, elite political actors have used practices of spatialization and discourses about the animal to produce, as the, our second paper shows, very powerful kinds of spatial fixes. Um, and um, I, I think that one of the things that I'd like maybe us to lead towards thinking about in that question I asked about an ecological orientation is, you know, for anyone who spent much time in a lot of these tiger reserves, right, as much as um, we see year on year increases purportedly in tiger numbers or rhino numbers, um, the ecological character of many of India's forests to continues to degrade in really profound ways. Um, if you spend time talking to forest guards and forest watchers about herbivore populations, there's a deep concern about where are the cheeto, where are the monkjack, where are the sambar, where are a lot of these herbivore species that purportedly we can um, not be concerned about given the increasing numbers of carnivores at the top, right, such as the, the tiger. Um, and yet we also know that these census approaches in their sort of anti-ecological approach uh, sort of refuse to count for um, the consumption of domestic species as part of these ecologies, of these landscapes, right? That increasingly tigers, especially, obviously this doesn't apply to rhinos, um, are reliant on the very populations of humans that have been displaced from these landscapes for, in part, their nutritional sustenance. Um, it's remarkable to me to think about how much of a lack of a focus on, for instance, we've seen, especially in Southern India on say things like Lantana um, within the context of talking about tigers. I'm reminded of a moment I, between 2010 and, and 2017, I guess, I went to India probably about once a year. And over that course of time, every time I sat down with forest department officials, and would ask about you know, how much space do these tigers you know, require, the amount of space that was required for an individual tiger continued to decline year on year because the map was based on this is how large the protected area is and this is our tiger census number. And so if you divide the two, this tells us how much space a tiger needs. Well, eventually what I noticed over time was that we went from a space of needing 12 square kilometers per tiger to four, which is an incredibly small amount of space. And I think we also know from an ecological perspective is an impossibility. Um, and so there's a displacement occurring, right? And so I think one of the things just to kind of pull back from all this is to say is I'm struck by how both, both the sense that there's a power at play in the focus and emphasis on these species, whether it's the tiger in this particular instance, because that's what I have more familiarity with, although I've been to Hazaranga, um, but also with the rhino, that there's a sense of what it means to manage these species it has very little to do with the species within actual ecological webs of relations, inclusive of the human populations that call these places home. Um, and so, one of, a question I would love to put to the to our uh, both of our our um, our groups of authors today is what what might it mean to think about um, in a more ecological orientation towards wildlife management in India? You know, and I'm thinking about. Um, this Wajid's paper here too, in the sense that this is such a fascinating history and chronology of the story of 
the sort of shifting discourses of the rhino and the tiger in the psalm and um and how these plant these animals can become sort of um important political discursive actors um but i also recognize it's an incredibly complex and challenging landscape right now um um, and one that's become extremely violent and politically fraught. And what would it mean at this point for us to practically recognize the importance of these landscapes for India's ecologies while orienting towards justice? Um, and, and, and does an ecological approach offer opportunities to think in a more justice-oriented way? And that, that's a big question, um, but I would love to sort of open up our Q&A by, by putting that question to both of our, both of our groups of authors. I don't know if any, if either, if um, any of our authors wants to raise a hand and maybe take a first stab. <laughs> it's logic. Uh, we can't hear you. No. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um... As a student of history, um, my training has been primarily to um, explain the past events, um, including the context in which certain episodes unfolded. Um, but uh, as, as Professor Mahesh Rangarajan suggested in his uh, brilliant talk, uh, the past also tells us, uh, gives us some learnings. So um, one of the remarkable things with respect to the Indian rhino, especially in Kajiranga, is that uh, it has attracted absolutely no ecological study so far. Right? Um, there are historical regions uh, dating back to 1970s where the US ecologist wanted to conduct this study, um, but that didn't materialize. And post that, um, uh, it has attracted no study of great substance. Everything else can be qualified broadly as uh, normal science. There is nothing that is as path-breaking as probably what we can see in um, Chituan's case, um, the, the marvelous work by Dynasty. Um, so uh, an absence of ecological research, uh, although it doesn't mean that the ecological research would come without biases, also means that the absence of an ecological resource also means that um, we tend to forget or we tend to relegate the past human relationship with a particular landscape to oblivion. We don't care about what was there in the past and that doesn't suggest, uh, that doesn't feed into our programs. So um, one of the remarkable things in uh, that has happened in Chetwan is um, that the paths earning go back to the community's uh, development, which is yet to happen in Kajiranga. This is happening in other ways, but not in terms of the paths earning going back to um, the, the community. Um, so in absence of ecological research, we um, tend to believe that uh, the past human presence in a complicated landscape like Kajiranga through say fishing or um, grazing or foraging was only an aberration and is not a historical process that had a context. So when aberration becomes seeing this relationship as aberration uh, um, uh, become the norm, the normal tendency is to do away with them. So I think, um, uh, ecological studies of um, you know um, rigorous caliber are, uh, are are required for a complex landscape like Kajiranga. But um, the second part of my answer would be also to recognize uh, what kind of human presence inside the park or the park's periphery. Uh, is 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 more harmful or at times can actually be called as um, part of the ecosystem in which the ecosystem has shaped in the past. A, a good example would be the the, the classic case of the buffaloes in Keoladeo uh, Khana. Right? Um, but it is also important to understand that this relationship would 
the constantly evolving, changing with the number of participants. Uh, uh, th this thing, these things, I think, are crucial. Um, but do we do we have a reason to believe that such complicated things will feed into a government's uh, working plan that tries to um, that tries to see things in black and white? You know, simplification, standardization, simplification, categories um, are the norm of the day. Um, but even a minuscule proportion of that getting into, even a recognition of this past relationship will probably help. So I see the ecological context of a complex geography like Kaziranga and the rhino bearing areas in the whole Indo-Gangetic Plains as something that has evolved through historical processes. So this has to be recognized and to be ecological minded, I think that is important. Thank you. Uh, Paramata, do you wanna, do you wanna respond to that? Yeah. I think, yeah, just building off of the last point that you made, uh, Biswajit, that even with the numerical fix, one of the key concerns that is emerging is this oversimplification, which you could, conservation, where conservation becomes completely removed from the actual landscapes and lives that it's affecting. Uh, and, and this attention to, and uh, this attention to a single metric also is granting authority to very specific kinds of expertise. And this is something that we are seeing with Lantana too. Now, all of these studies that have been coming out that document how the his, a history of giving authority to certain kinds of expertise led you know, to the banning of fire, the banning of litter fires, which Adivasi communities used to burn as a way to regulate the understory and to control the spread of weeds like Lantana. And so I think there's definitely this oversimplification has resulted in altering these landscapes quite significantly and taking away, even as we saw in the afternoon session, the expertise of those people who are navigating these landscapes every day and in relation with the species who are also navigating them, right? And so Lantana absolutely has to be talked about in relation to those kinds of knowledge practices that are being sidelined by this emphasis on charismatic species and single indicators of very complex contexts. Uh, yeah, I think that would be my only point unless one of the others want to jump in. While we're waiting for that, I, I do think it's also really interesting to make a comparison between the kinds of uh, the landscape, for instance, perimeter that, you, that you've worked in and worked around in, in Biswajit, in the sense that Kazaranga is a sort of unusual example in the context of India where burning, for instance, is actually something that is part of management, but pri primarily related to the political economy of tourism, right? As it was explained to me, at least, by a, a forest director there it was basically like, well, how else are people supposed to see the rhino? And of course, you know, the thought of um, widespread burning in a lot of the Southern landscapes is something that's seen as anathema to, to good uh, conservation management. And, and yet how that also then leads towards the use of fire as a form of both political protest, but also kind of, um, uh, a claim for ecological sovereignty in a certain way. I, I certainly remember um, speaking to someone who who lived alongside um, Bandipur, who explained that during one summer when there was some illegal lighting of for of the forest outside the forest director's office, you know, they said, "Well, it's good for the forest and it's bad for the forest department, right?" And so. Um, the way that, you know, um, a recognition of who holds ecological knowledge, but how that can become politically weaponized, but also maneuvered is a, a really interesting comparison between these sites. Um, I don't know if um, uh, either of the other co-authors um, wanted to chime in. I know I saw, um, I, I believe they're here, yeah? Nitin's here? Yeah, I, I am. I'm, I'm here. I am. I'm, I'm pretty, pretty ill. So I'm gonna, I'm you know, just concur with both of you about uh, about the 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 role of fire, and I think uh, I think you know, and this is I think the big question, which is despite decades of knowledge about what the suppression of fire has done in these landscapes to produce you know, uh, uh, lantana ridden and close canopy forests, these were woodland savannas that were maintained as open landscapes by people and producing a completely different biota. Um, so, you know, and there is a lot of information now and evidence to show that there is transformation that's happening 
And Lantana is one step in that transformation. I mean, what we're seeing areas of BRT that are now losing Lantana, but becoming mono-dominant uh, close canopy forests. And what those implications are for this singular focus on even on big cats like the tiger uh, is yet to be seen. But we can, you know, with very basic ecology 101, begin to think about, hey, you know, the, 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 this is a landscape and, and this is true for landscapes across India, not just BRT, you know, Corbett is full of lantana, Kana is full of lantana, Kaziranga burns because that grassland is integral to the rhino. So they make these exceptions on a case by case basis. Uh, but I think a whole lot of ecological awareness and studies are not feeding back uh, simply because I think we're still wedded to this carbon centric and also a tiger centric approach as we see today. Um, I saw Professor Rangarajan raised his hand and then um, after that we'll take um, HP has a hand up. Yeah, people should be able to unmute themselves now. I've just sorted that. Thank you. Uh, very specific question. Uh, uh, excellent papers, how the rhino or the tiger becomes a marker and it's quantified. And in a sense, it seems to overshadow it. Uh, it helps empower uh, officials, uh, managers, expand the intensity of control, uh, the expanses of uh, areas where they control labor, capital. How, how does this compare to similar iconic species in such intensely protected landscapes elsewhere in the world? Is this an issue integral to parks around iconic species or to park the notions of national parks themselves. So how far is this specific to the places of the time we are living through in India? Thanks. Would anyone um, like to respond to that question about sort of how this scales to thinking about other landscapes, other places, other countries perhaps? Big question. Um, I can only make an attempt. Um, what uh, strikes me about um, Indian parks, at least, or probably subcontinental parks, almost invariably, each of these are associated with a single charismatic fauna. So um, even if you have tigers in Kajiranga, you associate Kajiranga with the rhino, Tana for tiger, gear for lion, orbit for um tiger so on and so forth right um and and this association with a single um animal occasionally if um i mean occasionally also brings in um the regional the colors of regional politics along with it we see that in the case of um rhino we see that in the case of the lion as well uh, where the translocation attempts of lion uh, are still to materialize despite the Supreme Court order. <clears throat> um, this this, this um, re relative absence of associating with a single mammal, a big mammal in the other parks, uh, like Kroger or Serengeti or Ambosili, um, I do not know. I, have I haven't studied them in... in um, um, in, in great depth, but uh, multiple layers of nationalism are probably um, unique to Indian subcontinent, uh, with, even if it is with the animals. Uh, Sang idea in case of Manipur. Um, so this is my, um, this is my take. Um, I don't know if Paramita, you want to also respond to that or not. I was going to also bring up the question that HP has put in the chat. Um, 
And I was curious actually if Shruti is with us, if she would be interested in responding to this possibly as well. And the question, the, the full question is in the chat for anyone who wants to read it, but basically it's a question about the the use of the word, which of course is a, a really striking one for a lot of, you know, sort of folks interested in the history of Indian conservation around the use of the word inviolate in the context of the Wildlife Protection Act and its use in relationship to Project Tiger um, and where it comes from, um, which is a really interesting history. I don't know if, um, if Shruti, you'd be interested in responding to that or, or also, alternatively also Paramita. I'm not sure that I can link it specifically to Project Tiger, but, but I think more broadly this idea that nature and society are separate, that in order to save nature or uh, to save wildlife more specifically in this context, we have to uh, remove any human interaction or inhabitation within those spaces that, that have much longer history to colonialism um, and to like expansionism in the US, the, pro the creation of uh, protected areas and national parks more broadly, but maybe Nitin or Paramita can speak to how that came into tiger conservation specifically. I, I guess I would only build on what you said, Shruti. There's definitely this parallel of like global ideas about conservation coming in, which we have seen with something like Project Tiger and being initiated by organizations like WWF, which were drawing on Western ideas of conservation and building off of this idea of human society separation. And I think in the context of Indian policy, the reason we associate the idea of inviolateness so much with Project Tiger is because of the coinciding of Project Tiger beginning with the WLPA, the Wildlife Protection Act kind of happening right after one another. And the WLPA sort of institutionalized this uh, need for creating inviolate space as a foundational goal for conservation in India. And I think that's partly why we see it so strongly. And because tiger reserves have become among the different kinds of protected areas in India, the, th those that are given the strongest measures, the most fortification, right? Like the most fortification. I think we see that emphasis on creating them as inviolate spaces uh, quite strongly. Great. I would also um, uh, mention um, for for HP who asked the question, um, I think I think um, Michael Lewis's book, Inventing Global Ecology, is a really wonderful read that gives some insight into those histories as well, um, if you haven't seen that before. Other questions from 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 the audience for our 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 panelists. Um, there's a question in the chat from um, Pranav uh, who asks, is there a possibility to advocate for localization of data for tiger conservation that can invert the scalar logic of tiger numbers? Can communities be empowered to use these tech or is it similar to the logic that master's tools cannot dismantle the master's home? So a big question. Um, I don't know if, um, if anyone uh, would like to try to respond to that. Yeah, I would. I'd love to take a crack at it. I think it's a it's a great one because I think we've struggled with this question, right? In terms of uh, asking whether uh, you know all of the tools that have been oppressing people—drones, uh, camera traps, uh, technology—more centrally could be used to to counter power. Um, and I think. Uh, in India, I mean, you know, there are examples across the world, counter mapping in Indonesia or uh, in Africa. And so the institutional structures here are still so unequal, right? So, the, you know, if you look at, uh, Mahesh brought up this question of the Forest Rights Act. The implementation of the Forest Rights Act, which gives Gram Sabha's power over management, but also access, is still extremely poor. So, so, you know, the use of these technologies under such a completely different institutional structure would make a lot more sense um, than now, right? So, so I think we need really to, to pull down that master's house using a set of tools that are easily available through legislation first 
and then begin to think about, okay, using tech or using camera traps. You know, when I make these presentations through to Adivasi groups um, about how these numbers are put together and how much power the state then derives from tiger numbers using camera traps and so on, um, they, 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 they become quite uh, befuddled by it uh, because their political response to tiger numbers is that it's being inflated, right? Because you know that every time there's a tiger, uh, the ten tigers, then a patch of forest gets declared a tiger reserve. So, so I think we need really to think about institutional reformation first, um, and then this issue of 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 tech and and uh, unboxing this technology. And I'm reminded of you know work by Michael Adams and Chris Sandbrook and so on, and that talks about how these black boxing uh, should be democratized. But I think we need we need a few more steps uh, before we go there. But it's a great question. And a very great response also. Thanks so much. Um, other questions from, from the audience? Feel free to raise a hand or put it in the chat. Susan, can you remind me how what how long we go for? I think we have about four, four minutes left. Okay. But you know, it's not like we have to wait around. Um, if nobody has any questions, it's fine. Dominic, what do you think? Um, do you want to thank everyone now? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've been scrambling to try and think of a question, but there are so many thoughts going through my head. It's hard. And I've I've come down with a bit of an illness, so I'm managing that. Um, so, yeah, maybe I'll just wrap up. Um, well, first, uh, just a, a quick thank you to Jared for chairing that discussion uh, and Susan for the panel more generally. Um, we have been meeting for three weeks. Uh, on Fridays, we've had six panels. We've had 10 papers. We've had Topics that span the geography of the nation state. We've had histories that start from then and come to now. Um, we've had a really wild concatenation of ideas, arguments, and discussions. And I want to extend gratitude to everyone who came along and who, particularly for panelists, for respondents, who you know in many cases um received an email from me not knowing who i was not knowing what i was about uh, asking them to participate in this thing that was going on for three weeks and you know i'm really grateful that everyone said yes and then offered such fantastic and rich papers um i I guess I just want to, yeah, just want to say a thank you to Susan and Anu for the help in co-organizing, um, for the, the, the smooth running um, and the great questions. And also to Sam, Samantha, um, who has been fantastic um, helping me out um, whenever I need it. So I just want to say thank you. And um, finally, to the Lever Hume Trust who helped fund this. Um, I certainly am interested in um bringing together the papers into a potential publication and that includes maybe even the respondents in that if they're up for offering little um resp written responses um but i think that is something to discuss down the line um for now you know let's go away and have a great um break and let's come back in the new year so yeah thank you everyone Thanks, Monica and Mahesh. Can I just bri really briefly just, I just want to thank the 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 authors today. It was a, a real treat to get to listen carefully and closely with you and to learn from you. And um, it's really nice to think with all of you about, about this important topic um, that uh, is very close to my heart. So thank you um, for that. Cheers, everyone. Cheers, everyone. Thank you.